First Timothy chapter number six. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you get my Friday email. Every Friday I send out a little email of encouragement most of the time to uh, the congregation. And, and, and if you'll notice, uh, there's a little pattern often in my emails that toward the end of the email, I will put some bullets down there of some very important things that I did not want to leave out that could very well have been the main part of the body some announcements and some you know, upcoming events and that kind of thing, just some important stuff. And I'll always put that kind of down toward the end. That's exactly what Timothy uh, is receiving from Paul. Uh, Paul sent him an email and uh, before he finishes up, Paul says, hey, here's some bullets for you. Here's some important stuff uh, that I don't want you to remember. And <clears throat> they're in really in the form of commands. Here are some non-negotiables. Uh, here are some commands that uh, you have to have in your life. And you know what's amazing to me as I pastor and have pastored for uh, a long time now is uh, the number of Christian people that don't walk in victory. Um, they, they walk in defeat. They have joyless lives. There's no joy uh, that they live out in their life. And uh, they, they simply are leaning on the wrong things to find significance for their life. And these commands that Paul has given to Timothy, he's saying to Timothy, uh, this is not only for you, but this is for all generations to come to help them to walk in the power and the anointing and, and the freedom of Christ. And so if you have a, maybe a pen or a pencil, you may want to jot some of this down as we go along. The, the first one I want you to see with me today is a profitable pursuit, a profitable pursuit. Look at with, with me at verse 11, uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Now, the, these things are pointing backwards. He's saying, I, I don't want you to get caught up in the love of money and, 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 and trying to get rich. And, and I want you to make sure that you treat people the way that they ought to be treated. And, and, and so now just do, don't do some of those things that you're going to get caught up that's going to deviate you from the most important things. So flee, oh man of God, uh, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Now he starts out with Timothy. He says, you're a man of God. What a great title that that is. Uh, he, he put him in some pretty powerful company at that point. It, you know, you go back into the Old Testament, you discover that Moses was called a man of God. Eli was called a man of God. Samuel was called a man of God. Elijah was called a man of God. Elisha was called a man of God. So he put Timothy in some pretty powerful representation. And, and, and he's saying to Timothy, now watch the little phrase, follow after. Uh, really, it, it means pursue or get a dogged determination uh, to follow after. Put every muscle, every fiber, every sinew, every emotion that you possess into this pursuit. And then he gives this list. And frankly, folks, um, I, I could take that list and we could just kind of anchor down there for a long time. And we could make a little mini series just out of the list that he is providing uh, for Timothy. And so what he says now, I want you to get a dogged determination to pursue. And his first one is, I want you to pursue righteousness. I want you to pursue a right standing with God. You thought, well, wait a minute now. I thought, I, I, I thought Timothy was already a Christian. Paul is not talking about Timothy's position with God. That's already settled. The day, listen to this now, the day that you turned away from sin and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the day that God exchanged your sin for his righteousness and positionally made you right with God. 
You understand salvation is, is not a give and take kind of thing. It's a once and for all thing. God doesn't save you and take it away and save you again and take it away and save you again and take it away. Salvation is a one-time experience until the day that Jesus calls you home. So what he's talking about here is the daily manifestation of the position that God has placed you in. He says, I want you to pursue right living. I want you to pursue modeling that position. I want you to pursue the conduct that goes along with that right position. Demonstrate what is already manifested in your life. So Timothy, you've been made pure. Demonstrate purity. You've been brought out of darkness into the light, then show forth light. You have been set free from the bondage of sin, then don't live your life like a man in bondage. Live your life like a man that has been set free from sin. Pursue after right living. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your affection on things that are above, not on things on the earth. You're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So, so he says, live a life. Now, by the way, that word follow after here, uh, pursue righteousness, is the same derivative out of the Latin for integrity. If, if our country needed anything today, it needs a good baptism and a dose of integrity. It needs a good baptism of transparency and character and honesty and right living. So he says, pursue righteousness. Then the second list, he says, pursue godliness. Now I want you to listen to what, what, what this means, this word godliness here. It means all of the attributes of a life that is lived in the awareness that God is always watching. Live a life with all of the attributes of the awareness that whatever you're doing and whatever you're saying, God is always watching. Now, Kathy and Mama put on a big old thing of brownies yesterday. I reached for my second. God's watching. I said, God, do you want a brownie? You want a brownie? <laughs> the, the Bible calls it piety, Christ-likeness, mimicking or mirroring those traits for everybody to be able to see. Paul said it really good in his letter to the book of Corinthians. He says to the people of Corinth, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You understand we're to be little imitators of the Lord. We're to be little mimickers of the life of Christ. And then third, he says to pursue faith. Pursue faith. He says, go after this like a dog would a bone. You know, when I read the New Testament and I see the correlation of the disciples with uh, the Lord, no time did the disciples ever say to Christ, Lord, uh, would you increase our popularity? At no time did they ever say, uh, would you increase our ability to preach? The only thing that they ever asked Christ to increase in them was their faith. You know, our faith ought never to be stagnant. Our faith should, should always be increasing. We're, we're about to end up 2018. I, I simply want to ask you a question. Are you trusting God for more today than you were this time last year? Or have you slipped back maybe some? But, but faith is never to be stagnant. It, it is to consistently and constantly be growing. I, I'm, I'm looking at what, where direction I want to go in uh, for 2019 in the Word, and, and I'm really leaning toward Hebrews. I've never preached a whole lot out of the book of Hebrews, and I, I'm thinking seriously uh, about going verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. 
And, and I can't wait, if that's where God lands me, I can't wait to get into chapter 11 because that's the, the chapter of the heroes of the faith. And when you look at those great men and women of God, you discover that they had more faith when they died than they ever did during their life. Why? Because faith is growing. Faith is not stagnant in their life. We ought to be believing God more now than ever before. And then he says in the fourth one, he says, pursue love. Pursue love. Powerful, powerful words. Can, can I brag on you just a minute? I, I probably don't brag on you enough. I love the way you love each other. I, I love the way when somebody comes to the altar how that you just wrap them up and, and, and pray with them. I, I love how things develop in our small groups and how you rally around one another, support one another. I just love the way that this church loves. And not only that, it's not just confined to this ministry. I love the way you love this community and the way you wrap your arms around them. By the way, can I just go on a little bit further and just say, that when you're pursuing love, it really ought to be in the confines of your marriage too. Your, your love in your marriage ought to really be growing and never stagnant. You ought to love your husband or your wife more now than you ever have it before. You, you, when, when you first got married, you, you, mean you had goo-goo eyes and you had the goosebumps and, and oh my word, it was just... I, I, we won't use some of the graphic terminologies that go with all of that, but it was just, you just thought, I can't love anymore. But all of a sudden the bills started showing up. Huh? And then the babies started coming and the dirty diapers had to be washed and the two o'clock feedings. A little more time goes by and all of a sudden uh, the body begins to change and shift around a little bit. And you're thinking in your mind, Wow, what was I thinking when I married that person? You know? But, but, but I want to tell you something. Our, our marriage and our love, we ought to be stronger now than ever in all of our married life. Then, then, then he gives us this next one, the word patience. Pursue patience. Now, I, I hope you would do this Maybe your translation is different than mine. Patience is not a good word right there. It's the word hupomene. It translates a whole lot better in the word endurance. So you might ought to write that word down somewhere. The word endurance. It, it means that sure enough, there have been some mountains you've had to go over. Sure, sure enough, there have been some valleys that you've had to go through. Sure enough, there have been some health storms and, and some job situations that, that may not necessarily have been so ideal in your life. But you see those times as times that God has allowed you to lean on him and to trust him and to praise him and to grow through that testing of your walk with him in those times. I, I, I want to kind of give you a little parenthetical something. I, I don't like people striking deals with God. I really don't. You ought not to be in the habit of striking deals with God. I, I've sat with people for 45 years and pastor, oh pastor, would, would you pray with us that, that, and I promise God, if he'll just get me through this, if he'll just deliver me, God, God if you'll just uh, uh, let me over, if God, you'll just get rid of this, I promise you, I'll serve you more than I have. Y'all not to strike deals with God. Now, I know you're not in the habit of reading Habakkuk. Matter of fact, if you don't know where it is, look in the table of contents for just a minute. I want you to find the third chapter, okay? Habakkuk chapter number three. And I want you to see a passage in there that in verse 17 that is mind-boggling to you. But I believe it'll become one of your favorite verses in all of the Bible. It's Habakkuk chapter, take, go to Matthew and hook a left 
and, and just keep turning. You'll come, you'll come across it. In verse 17 of chapter three, I want you to listen. Y'all listening? Say amen. amen. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. So that when the job promotion that you've been anticipating and looking for and maybe even having been promised falls through, when the bills exceed your ability to pay and when your teenager goes nuts and goes awry, when you get to that point that it seems that your marriage is on the rock, when your health is debilitating and it looks like that the roof is just gonna cave in on you, get to the place where you'll say, yet, I will still praise my God because my praise is not tied to my circumstances. My praise is tied to the worthiness of my God. So when there's no sheep in the pasture, when there's no grapes on the vine, when there's no health on the bones, I will still praise God. God, that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Pursue endurance. All right, then he says, pursue meekness. Meekness, that's part of the fruit of the spirit, by the way. It means the spirit of calmness and nonviolence when you've been had. How many of you have been had? somewhere in your lifespan. Somebody took advantage of you. Somebody lied about you. Somebody stuck a knife in your back. Somebody cheated you at the store. Somebody sold you a, some kind of bad investment along the way. And they did you in. It means that even in the midst of that, you maintain a spirit of calmness and nonviolence when somebody does you in. Oh, how we need that today. Number two, I, that, that, by the way, that's number one. Let me give you number two. We have a profitable pursuit. But now then, a pertinent priority. A pertinent priority. Fight the good fight of faith, verse 12. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, fight. And he's saying the same thing to you and me. Fight. You say, well, preacher, I, I'm not a fighter. I'm a lover. But I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> if you're going to be a Christian, you better learn to do both. You better learn to do both. You better learn to love. You better learn to fight. You, you say, is there such a good thing, is such a thing as a good fight? Is there a place where we ought to fight? Absolutely. And it's really in our Christian life. Okay. Now, let me just point out something to you. You ready for this? I don't have to tell you this. That's not accidental. Because the enemy does not want you to hear what you're about to hear. I assure you of that. Okay? That's just a diversion. It's just proof positive you're going to need what I am uh, about to give you. Y you see, there is such a place that we ought to fight. It is the Christian life. I've told you for 35 years, the Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground, if you will. Now, notice what he says here in, in verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. That word fight there is the word agonize, where we get our word agonize. 
Let me give you a picture of what that looks like. Friday night, this coming Friday night, on our field over here at Lake Park, Metrolina Christian Academy is going to be playing for the state championship in football. Now, how did they get there? They started a long time ago. Long before school ever started, they started pumping weights. They started doing wind sprints. They started scrimmaging. They, they started getting ready for that first game. And they continued all of that. And even this week, we'll be continuing to do that, getting ready for the fight that is gonna take place on Friday night. So every muscle, every fiber, they have stretched, they have exercised, they have worked out, they have gotten ready for that event. So it's an athletic term, but it's also a military term that shows us a military man who is turning away from his job, turning away from his domestic responsibilities and picking up his shield, picking up the sword, picking up the javelin, and he's headed toward the war because he is a committed soldier. Uh, th that's where all of this picture is coming from as Paul is relating, coming from a life of ease to get into the war. Let, let me just say to you, if you're going to walk in victory, you better get ready for the battle. You better be committed to the fight. Who are we gonna fight? We fighting the devil the whole way. The problem is, and I watch this so often across Christendom, really, and that is that we tend to fight with each other instead of who the real enemy is. We, we, wanna, we wanna fight against the victims of Satan more than we wanna fight Satan. We, we wanna fight uh, the results of Satan more than we wanna fight Satan. But the battle is with the enemy. The Bible says we don't war against flesh and blood, but who do we war against? principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness that seeks to exalt itself above God. That, that's what we're fighting against. We are fighting the devil. You, you, you say, you say uh, well, are we fighting in order to get victory? Absolutely not. You, you gotta understand, Satan's already defeated. He was permanently defeated on Calvary. We, but we're, we're fighting to keep him from using deceit, deception, and lies against us to keep us from being effective for Christ. Can I get an amen right there? Now, let me give you five quick things, if I can, what's involved in that fight. You ready for this? Number one, you gotta know who the enemy is. He's the father of lies, he's a deceiver, he's a liar, and his one desire is this, he wants to decimate the church. He wants to destroy your testimony to keep you from being an effective witness for Christ. Number two, you gotta know what his strategy is. I, I promise you this, Coach Langley right now is probably looking at film and looking at the strategy of Country Day because that's who they're playing Friday night and trying to determine what strategy are they going to use to try to score against us. And if you're gonna win against the enemy, you better know what his strategy is. Number three, you need to avail yourself to the armor that God has supplied. That means that every day when you get up, before you ever leave the house, you get spiritually dressed for the day. You put on the helmet of salvation. You put on the breastplate of righteousness. You put on the belt. You put on the, 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 the shoes that are there for the preparation. You, you, get, you get dressed spiritually every day before you go out. You pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, listen to me. You can live your life in one of two ways. You can just look at Ephesians 6, which is where I'm getting the, the, the armor. You, you can look at Ephesians 6 and say, well, you know, I, I know what that says, but it doesn't mean anything to me. And you can go on and try to live your life void of the spiritual weapons you're gonna need to get victory. 
or you can get dressed up every day and put on the whole armor of God and walk through this life with great confidence and victory. The choice is really yours. Number four is take hold of eternal life. Uh, look at this. You say, I already have eternal life. Well, he's not talking again about positionally. He's talking about reaffirming your position. He's talking about acknowledging the fact that you are saved, that you are on your way to glory. And you then do something. I, I would to God. I, I'm telling you what's missing at First Baptist Church in Indian Trail. It, it's this very element of taking hold of eternal life when you acknowledge, you know, I'm born again. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. I'm on my way to heaven and nothing's ever gonna take that away from me. I'm in the palm of the hand of God. He is never gonna let anything take me out of that. And, and, and acknowledge who you are before Christ and then in Jesus' name, talk about it. Talk about it. One of the biggest victories that Satan has won is shut the mouths of those who have been set free. Learn how to talk about it. I'm amazed at how many people acquiesce to the enemy. I hear this all of the time. Well, preacher, I, I know I'm saved. I, I know I'm on way ahead. I, I just can't get over what I did. I, I just so wicked and so vile. I, I know God's forgiven me of it and I, I just can't, I can't forgive myself. Well, you need to get over that. You know why? If God truly has forgiven you, he's never going to bring up what he has already forgiven you of and that's nothing in the world but the tool of guilt that Satan uses to keep you from walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and what that ha when that happens and Satan's bringing up your past, tell him about his future. Amen. Let him know where he's going. Now, let me rapidly go to number five. Remember your confession. That's what Paul is talking to Timothy about. Remember your confession. What is the confession? That Jesus Christ is Lord. Where were you? Where were you? When you stood and named the name of Jesus, confessed him as your Lord. Where were you when you turned away from sin, placed your faith in Jesus and said, God has changed me by his grace and glory. Where were you when you confessed Jesus Christ is your Lord and is your Savior. What does that mean? It simply means I'm not gonna go where I wanna go anymore. I'm gonna go where God wants me to go. It means that it's not my agenda anymore that I'm gonna live my life by. It means I'm gonna live my life by God's agenda. It means that I'm not gonna contrive nor to manipulate God. It simply means I will not see God as some kind of monetary storehouse or make demands on God to meet all of the needs of my life. It means that I am at his disposal and from this moment on, his agenda is gonna be my agenda. I am not my own. Where were you? <clears throat> not being mean, not being ugly. I love you with all my heart. But anything short of that, you don't have the real thing. And it won't work. Let me give you number three. They're all P's, so to help you remember it. A proper praise. Look at this in verse 14, 15, and 16. Well, look at 15. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only ruler, potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords, who only hath immortality. By the way, uh, the, only, the only immortality you have is through him <laughs> and by him, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. I was looking yesterday on Twitter and I saw where this athlete, it may have been Friday, 
this athlete talked about, he was going through a rough time, had gotten hurt and couldn't play football. And he, he was talking about, well, it's whatever the man upstairs wants. I, I'm gonna tell you something. God's not the man upstairs. <laughs> he is not your buddy. He is not your co-pilot. He is not your partner. He's king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He's the ruler of this universe. He is God Almighty. And all we can do is hold our hands up and say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Paul says to Timothy right here, there is a proper praise. And Timothy, your job as a preacher and pastor down there at the church of Ephesus, your job is to make God look good. And that's our job, to make God Look good. Confess him as king of kings and God of very gods. Is he your king? Is he your Lord? Is he your savior? Um, what about your faith? Is your faith stagnant or is it growing? Is your love stagnant or is it growing? Are you closer to God today than you were this time last year? How's your relationship with him? Do you acknowledge, do, do you get up in the morning and dress up for God and get ready to do battle with him or are you walking a life that has no joy and you're self-sufficient and self-dependent and you get overcome almost every day and you're living a joyless life. And as a matter of fact, some of you today have never understood that God set you free from the bondage of sin and you keep giving yourself to the same old stuff over and over again. Keep confessing the same old sin over and over again. Keep getting up and living the life the same old way every day. When God has so much more for you. So much more for you. Are you willing to say, God, not my agenda anymore. I've tried it my way and it doesn't work. And God, with your help, I'm going to go your direction. I'll say what you want me to say. Go where you want me to go. Do what you want me to do. And God, I'm tired of fighting this stuff in my own strength. And I'm going to start practicing every day. I'm going to get up and I'm going to dress up spiritually. I'm going to put that helmet on. I'm going to put that breastplate on. I'm going to put that belt on. I'm going to put those shoes on. I'm going to grab that sword. I, I'm going to make this. God, with your help, I'll be the man. I'll be the woman you want me to be every day. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Father, I believe with all of my heart that you've sent a ton of people this way this morning to hear this word. God, I believe with all my heart you laid this word on my heart for this season, for this hour, for this people. And Lord, there we all in the room right now, we have decisions to make, every one of us. And that decision is, are we gonna remain the same going out that door as we did when we came into the door? Or do we want to be different? Do we want to grow and mature? Do we want to walk in victory and power? The power of your might? Or do we want to just continue to live ho-hum Christian lives? Lord, I believe that there's some people here this morning that have never surrendered to you as Lord of their life. God, if they were to die today, they'd spend eternity in hell. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would save their soul today. Save their soul right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.